from Hilly to Scani. Welcome to the GCN show. Welcome to the GCN show. Coming up this week, would we want our kids to become pro cyclists? Dan and I will be discussing the highs and lows of pro life. We have also got a new bike brand from Africa, an increase in frame manufacturing in Europe, and the story of some poor homeless people whose bikes were deliberately trashed. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that Mark Cavendish averaged over 72 kilometers per hour for the final 17 seconds of stage three of the Giro d'Italia. That's almost 45 miles per hour. No wonder nobody could come around him. We also learned that Cy did take the record on the King Alfred's way. Fair play. Although obviously everyone will now be able to topple him from his throne. So I don't think that his record is going to last particularly long. Well, it won't be that easy to break. 361 kilometers covered in 16 hours and 55 minutes, of which 15 hours and 39 minutes was riding time, an average speed of 22.8 over some very, very tough terrain indeed. The first rule of GCN Club, Connor, is do not inflate the presenter's egos. But you are right, I will admit, he does deserve some applause for that one. Well done to you, Cy. Well done, Cy. Finally this week, though, we learned that Matthew van der Poel's cork popping skills need some work. Of the UCI and Alessio Cremonese, CEO Man Manufattura Varcismo. It was a close one, wasn't it? I mean, you'd have thought he'd have had enough practice of doing that by now, wouldn't you? He almost took his eye out there. All right, on to our main topic of discussion for today's GCN show then. And it was provoked by this comment that we received underneath last week's show by Kevin Farron. Kevin wrote, knowing what you do about the world of pro cycling, would you want your kids to follow in your footsteps? And strangely, I had discussed this exact same topic with Cy, I think just the day before that show was released, the morning that we filmed it. Uh, now, before we get on to answering the actual question, I think it's safe to say that all of the presenters at GZN who have children either have encouraged or will be encouraging them to go out and ride a bike. Definitely, it's almost a key life skill, yeah. isn't it really? It gives you freedom and enjoyment, it keeps you mentally and physically healthy, and there is very little negative to say about riding a bike. No, I agree. I encourage both of my children from a very young age to be on two wheels, and both of them, I seem to remember, had their stabilizer or their training wheels off just after they turned three years old. And I think, looking back, that they are some of my fondest life memories. Seeing your child pedal and balance on two wheels for the very first time, it's just an, it's an absolutely incredible feeling seeing that. Yeah, definitely. Jesse isn't on a pedal bike yet, but he's on his balance bike and right. he, he's loving it. Actually, sometimes I have to hide the bike when we leave the house. <laughs> so he just wants to go on the bike and you want to go somewhere. However, there is a big difference between being a carefree three-year-old on a balance bike and life as a pro cyclist. There is, but before we get on to some of the negative aspects of being a pro cyclist, I guess, Connor, we should probably list out some of the positives because there are a lot of positives, aren't there, about being a professional cyclist. So first and foremost, if you're a pro, you're probably living out your own childhood dream and indeed the dream of most fans who are watching either on the roadside or indeed on TV at home. That is true, and you also get to travel the world. You see places and experience cultures that you might not normally get to. You mm. go to some really kind of different corners of the Dude, world. It's fantastic. Um, and it also helps you grow up in a way to become independent, making your way in cycling. It's almost like, it's like going to university, isn't it, from that point? It is a bit like going to university, yes. Plus, a major benefit is that the hotels you go to are paid for. I liked that point. Uh, everything except for the actual riding is also done for you. And you're paid to do the whole thing. And let's be honest, the pay is not that bad, it's decent. Cycling might not be golf or football or Formula One, but I think the minimum wage for a World Tour cyclist now is 50,000 euros. And if you get some half decent results, you'll soon be on a lot more yeah. than that too. Beyond that though, if you're a professional cyclist, you're having a healthy lifestyle, you're active, you're always out in the open, and you're kind of your own boss to a certain extent. You're in yep. control of your own training. Yeah, so those are some of the many positives to being a pro cyclist. And in some ways, it's quite hard to express any sympathy towards someone that's living that life if they're not getting on with it. They've got everything they ever wanted, surely. For, for, for most, yes, but like all walks of life, things aren't always as rosy on the inside as they appear to be on the outside. Being a pro athlete in any sport brings with it pressure, pressure to perform from your team, the fans, commentators. Yeah. 
pundits and uh, from, from you yourself too. Yes, you do put a lot of pressure on yourself, don't you? Uh, if you're at the top end of the sport, I guess that pressure really revolves around backing up previous wins and previous performances. If you're at the lower end of the sport, uh, that pressure revolves more <laughs> around just keeping your career going, doesn't it? Going out and searching for a new contract to make sure you're still a pro cyclist the following year. Yeah, and you also never get away from it in your mind, even if you're not on your bike, barely a minute goes by when you're not questioning whether you're doing the right thing for your job, am I on my feet too much, am I resting enough, mm. am I eating the right things, am I eating too much, is my weight okay, could I be training harder or differently? There are a lot of questions. Yeah. One of the questions I used to regularly ask myself, Connor, is should I have had that beer? Or the one before that. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, you are right, bang on. The only time that you get away from that pressure and that mindset is the three or four weeks off season that you get at the end of each year. There, you can just switch off, relax, and get away from it all in your head as much you as can. your body. Although even sometimes I would be thinking about it even <laughs> then. But anyway, now in answer to the original question from Kevin, would I want my kids to follow in my footsteps? I think no, no is maybe the short answer. I love riding my bike with my son and all I'd ever want from him really is just to enjoy a nice ride with him. You don't, you don't need to get into racing to experience that from cycling. Mm. I would be nervous if my kids riding professionally if they did get into it, mainly because I think the pressures involved in high level sport are just so great and I'm not sure I'd want them to be thrown into that. Recently I've been working on a GCN Plus documentary about eating disorders in professional cycling mm. and it did just hit home how far people push themselves to succeed in professional sport. Yeah. If my kids decide they want to try bike racing, I'd support them just as my dad did for me, but I'm not sure it's something I'd actively encourage. How about you, Dan? I'm not sure. If you'd have asked me this question a couple of years ago, maybe just one year ago, I'd have said, yes, absolutely. I would love to see my kids racing professionally. Now though, I'm questioning that, which is exactly what I was talking to Si about before last week's show. I'm not sure if it's my age, but I've just suddenly become much more acutely aware of the dangers of professional cycling. I mean, the risks never really entered my head when I was racing myself, but when I watch now and I see the frequency of the crashes and the consequences of those crashes, I do question whether or not I'd really enjoy watching my kids in a professional bike race. I'd be proud, immensely proud, if they did do that, but I also think I'd have my heart in my mouth the whole time that I was watching. But then on the other hand, I loved my time as a pro rider, and it's also given me the life that I live today, which I'm enjoying equally as much. So I kind of can't really make my mind up about it. I'm on the fence. Yeah, I, sh I should say that I would hope that my own experiences would be useful too in guiding and helping my kids if they do end up as a pro cyclist, if they were to experience any difficult times along the yeah, way. Yeah, I'd you know, so as well. Make it a bit easier for them and, and teach them a bit yeah. how, to, how to get the most out of the sport. Very true. I, and like you, I would never discourage my children from doing anything really that they're really passionate about and that they want to pursue. But on the flip side, we all know of parents, don't we, who are basically trying to live out their own dreams through their children, heaping pressure and expectation upon them. And I always find that difficult to watch, I've got to say. It is difficult to watch, it is. Anyway, we would like to hear your thoughts. Would you like to see your child become a pro cyclist? If so, why? If not, why not? Or has your child become a professional cyclist? Probably fairly unlikely, but if they have, let us know. What's it like to be that parent? Uh, you can let us know in the comment section just down below this video. Now, just before we move on, a reminder that whether or not your child is racing, you can indeed watch the Giro d'Italia live and on demand on GCN+. We've got it live in all territories except for New Zealand. The race resumed in Italy today with a mountaintop finish to Etna and there are some cracking stages to come, particularly this weekend with a tricky stage around Napoli on Saturday and another tough mountaintop finish to Blockhouse on Sunday. Yeah, a weekend not to be missed. So if you are yet to subscribe to GSM Plus, get on board. We would love to have your company for the next two and a half weeks around Italy. Next up, your weekly GCN inspiration, your opportunity to win one of three prizes. All you need to do is upload your most inspirational cycling photos or videos to the GCN app, and we pick out our favorite three each week. And in third place, the winner of the GCN mug, small, is Hans Flensted. Roads with snow walls should be on the bucket list for any cyclist. This is Glacier Road at Folgefonna National Park in Norway. Wow, beautiful. It's like the Garvia, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Such high snow walls there, yeah. absolutely stunning. 
What a beautiful day though. I would imagine it probably wasn't. I was going to say it probably wasn't that cold, but it's Norway. But it's freezing. it's freezing. Anyway, yes. now you can enjoy a nice coffee at the top. You just yes. mug. Uh, second place this week will get themselves a classic zip hoodie in blue, and it goes to Stark 62. Uh, my BMC, having just ridden from LA to Boston, bought a bike, trained for nine months, and then rode from, rode from LA to Boston in 48 days. Seeing the US at 16 miles per hour average was the best. It's huge, it's beautiful, and it's varied. Three and a half thousand miles of truly feeling alive. Wow, that's epic. Nice work. Oh, I'm jealous of that trip. Yeah, I mean, imagine getting to the end of that trip and, and looking back on what you've done, but also having your bike there with that sort of background. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, first place this week will get themselves a Corsa Rosa hoodie, which you may have noticed I've been sporting, not just down the GCN show, but for the last three days on the Breakaway show, pre and post Giro stages. Uh, I have only got one, it probably stinks. Thank goodness you can't smell it at home. Uh, along with that, I get a Corsa Rosa t-shirt and a pink Giesen Elite water bottle, all of which, I'll remind you, are available to buy over at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com if you're not lucky enough to be the winner. But the winner today is, a drum roll there, Kavicha 9119, first ever 100 miler, set off at 4.15 a.m. to catch the sunrise at the beach, and the closer I got to home, the more I wanted to keep going, so I decided to extend my ride and reach 100 miles for the first time. Very, Congratulations. very cool. Wow, uh, You haven't told us exactly where in the world you are, and I can't tell from the photo, but you've got to love a sunrise or a sunset cracking. shot, haven't you? Absolutely cracking. And now you can add a whole load of pink to your wardrobe, and indeed, to your bike, so well done to you. Uh, don't forget to get involved ready for next week's show. I look forward to seeing your inspirational cycling photos. And now it's time for cycling shorts. Cycling shorts now, and we'll start with a ride around the entire border of Yorkshire, a county here in the UK steeped in cycling history. Robert Ormrod has created the Y500, a 500 mile route around the county perimeter and is aiming to complete the route in three days. Raising money for Land Aid and the Alzheimer's Society in the process. Now in total, there is over 31,000 feet of ascent. Anyone who's ever ridden in Yorkshire will know just how tough it is up there. So good luck to Rob and indeed the team that are taking this on. From Yorkshire to Namibia now and Onguza Bikes, this is a great story. Friend of the channel, Dan Craven, a pro for over 15 years and who some of you may know as having the best beard in pro cycling, has set up a frame building workshop in his hometown of Amaruru. Yeah, which is providing a place for local talented people to build and then sell quality steel frames, providing employment in a very high value trade. Called Onguza Bikes, the aim is to put Africa on the map as a place to buy world-class steel framed bikes. They received help from the likes of Tom Sturdy, Columbus and Bicycle Academy to get started. And Onguza's first builders, Petrus Mufungi and Sakaria Nugolo, are already at work. It's brilliant, isn't it? I'll tell you what, I'm really looking forward to seeing the bikes that are going to emerge from that particular project. An exciting one, I think, to keep our eyes on. All right, staying on the topic of frame building, one company that believes manufacturing of components is poised to return from mainly Asia and back towards Europe is Carbon Team. They hope to make 150 carbon bike frames per day by 2023, which would make them the only company to mass produce carbon frames in Europe. They also believe that if demand takes off, they could potentially start producing around 110,000 carbon frames every year. 110,000 frames a year. That'd be quite something, wouldn't it? Uh, the COVID pandemic has obviously increased shipping costs from Asia, so being able to produce frames nearer to where they are eventually assembled in Europe is a big positive that's working in Carbon Team's favour, seeing as they're based over in Portugal. Wage rises for factory workers in Asia and those freight shipping costs back to Europe are starting to see changes, albeit small ones, to the trend of brands buying from the region. Could Europe again become the main hub of bike manufacturing along with Africa, perhaps? I'm not, I'm not sure, but it certainly seems like there might be a more even spread across different uh, nations and continents in the near future. Uh, anyway, sticking, unfortunately, on the subject of COVID, we've talked a lot, haven't we, about how bicycle use has surged through the pandemic over the last couple of years, and it seems that's now also true for China, that's currently in a strict lockdown. They have seen a 70% surge in bicycle usage 
just last week. I didn't know this, but China used to be called the Bicycle Kingdom in the second half yeah, of the 20th century, either. when the communist country was behind in the use of the car as a main mode of transport. Bikes have now flooded the streets of Beijing and Shanghai with subways closed and buses on a reduced timetable too. Hopefully, something that remains in the future in terms of bicycle use. Well, maybe there will eventually be nine million bicycles in Beijing, Connor. Sorry, my jokes are really, really bad today. Anyway, moving on to this piece of very sad news from San Diego that you may well have seen because it went viral on social media last week. And the video shows city workers or sanitation crews basically clearing homeless people's possessions, anything from tents, which is saddening itself, uh, but what was perhaps worse than the tents and anything else was seeing bicycles thrown away as well, all into a dumpster truck. It's horrible to watch, isn't it? Particularly as the bikes were in perfect working order mm. too. The clip originally posted by Michael McConnell, a local advocate for ending homelessness, quite rightly caused uproar online. Yes, quite rightly. Uh, there were some people who pointed out that bikes were tagged as abandoned, so were being cleared. But still, throwing a bike away when it could be recycled or donate is just such a waste, isn't it? Hard to believe, to be honest, that this actually happened, especially when we're talking about homeless people here, for whom a bike is such a valuable tool for transport. Saddening to see, I think you'll all agree. Hack forward slash bodge of the week now. First up this week, this one from Z Zabrocoli. 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 Uh, old Mag Trainer New Wheel Station. I found an old magnetic trainer at Goodwill for $10 years ago. Since upgrading to a tax flux, it's been sitting in my garage. So I decided to repurpose it into a workstation for maintaining my wheels. Classic hack, isn't it? I mean, you can't argue with that. It well, just does the job. 92% of people have voted that hack. Uh, I can't see the truing bits that have been added to try and make sure that you get your rim in true. Maybe that will come at a later date because without that, what, what do you do to your wheel? Do it by eye. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, what do you do with the wheel on the stand? Clean it? Store yeah. it? I mean, it's, yeah. Maybe I'm just missing something there. Probably am. Uh, I'll give it a hack anyway. I'll give it a hack because, yeah. Okay, next up we have a chain keeper. Always hack. A, always a favourite. <laughs> this one has been sent in by Amu Jis Hont. And uh, they made a little wheel that goes on the through axle that allows them to work on the drivetrain when the rear wheel is off and just to keep the frame nice and protected from the chain. Yeah, okay. everyone everyone knows that I do like a good chain keeper. That's a, that's a particularly nice one actually. I must yeah, say. done a very good job. So it's yeah. a definite hack. Yeah, hack from me too. Yeah, that's a 88% of you. Uh, next up, SA3 Key. Saw this bike at a race. I asked him about it and he said that he puts his pedal stroke in front of where the normal point is and allows him to transfer more power. Uh, I tried to explain to him that it was no different than just having the crank arm a little bit forward from its normal position, but he swears by it. I don't buy it. I can't, this can't be it. This can't be a hack. <laughs> this is going to be a this is, very, this is, I think this is skewed logic. <laughs> because the other pedal is going to be in a similar position. So it's just, it's just added weight. Yeah, so it make, makes no difference. You're still just the same no. distance away from the centre of the crank. Yeah. It's, it, I do not get that at all. Maybe you just need longer cranks? It's, it's baffled us, it's baffled us. I don't think this is a hack. I I'm think it's well, a big I'm bodge. I mean, I'm definitely going bodge. An unnecessary bodge at that. Yeah, um, I yeah. don't think you're achieving anything there. That's a bit like the, um, the right-handed crank that came out years ago, which again, made no difference because you're still just a certain uh, point away from the center of the crank. Uh, bodge from me, bodge from Connor, and bodge from 92% of you. That's pretty, uh, pretty definite, isn't it? This next one has been sent in by Sergio Faroit, and this is three weeks at the cancer hospital. Exactly a year ago, I went through a tough treatment to fight a blood cancer. I had an exercise bike in my hospital room, but my cyclist soul wasn't very happy with it. So I modified it for better rides. It has been my last treatment, and now I'm back on the road stronger than before, which we are really happy to hear. That is great to hear, Sergio. Well done, and all the best in your future recovery. I hope you remove that saddle. Uh, I'll put it back on once you left, though, because a lot of people would look at that and it would put them off. You know, people that are non-cyclists would look at the replaced saddle and think, no way I'm getting on that. It looks very uncomfortable indeed. Oh, I, think, I think it's got to be a hack. Oh, of course, it's a definitive hack, and 
5% of people for some reason said that was a bodge, but 95% doing what was right, I think, and voting that a hack. Uh, right, that's all for this week's hacks and bodges. Don't forget, you can get involved for two weeks' time by submitting your hacks or bodges to the GSIN app. Next week's are there for you to vote and comment on if you so wish. Right then, time for caption competition now, always my favourite part of the show, and your chance to win a GCN Elite water bottle. Last week we had uh, this podium picture from Frankfurt, I believe. From Esbon Frankfurt, yes. Uh, the winner of the caption competition this week is Andy Taylor, who put, now I just need to make my hands grow a bit bigger. Ah, oh, I see what you did there. Genius. Yeah, it's good. I that's think good that's one. absolutely brilliant. And again, touch with us on Facebook with your address. We'll get a bottle sent out to you. Uh, this week's photo comes from the Giro d'Italia in Hungary last week. Uh, I will get you started. Go on then, go on then. I can't think. I'm trying to think of one. Machi van der Poel passes the bunch. That's my best commentary voice. Say so something. <laughs> It's not the best, even by my standards, I've got to admit. I'm sure you'll be able to do a hell of a lot better than I did this week. Leave your captions in the comment section down below and one of you will win a GCN bottle this time next week. Just before we get on to what's coming up on GCN this week, a, a few of our favorite comments, I should say, from the last week's worth of video. Starting with this one underneath last week's show from Ed, who put, while discussing asphalt art and the science behind it, Sai takes the opportunity to note that it is not concrete science. Obviously, it's asphalt science. <laughs> <laughs> Under size came out for his way record as well, Robert Tell. Shy, challenging Hank for the title of resident yes. maniac. Nearly 17 hours of riding and cows. Well done. Yeah, Colin Littlewood put absolutely fantastic effort by Sai and a great job by everyone else who put this together. A beautiful video with some beautiful shots throughout. He has got some power, hasn't he, Sai? Yeah, he's got some power, he's got some, power, he's got some determination, but you're right, Colin. Uh, there's a great team behind the scenes at GZ who do a brilliant job on all of these edits. Yeah, too right. How to master cycling in six easy steps, Caroline Kunz. So what color do you want your bike to be? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Explain your color choice. Well, I, I was lucky enough to be given the option to design my own um, Orbea Orca through Orbea's kind of custom Mayo um, customization program. And I just thought, I'm just gonna go all in. I mean, if you've got that chance, you've got well, to go all in. I, I will give you that. You did go all in. Yeah, I, I love it, actually. It's really You're happy with your yeah, outcome. I'm really happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. I do feel like people kind of notice me when I'm no, riding. It's not subtle, is it? I think they might notice you anyway, Connor, but with that bike, even more so. I think so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly conscious, but I'm, I'm rolling with it. I love it. Yeah. Right, on to what we've got coming up this week. On Wednesday, we are going to show you how to pace your rides properly. Really important if you're starting to embark on sentries or something slightly longer than you're normally used to. And on Thursday, five basic road bike skills that you are able to learn anywhere. And then on Friday, GCN tries hand cycling. Yeah, and I believe there is a, a scene where Hank might crash. Yes, Hank manages to crash a hand cycle. Not sure how, but I'm gonna watch the video to he find out. He bashed himself up quite badly. He did, he? yeah, he did. Yeah. Probably cornering too fast or something <laughs> silly. Anyway, on Saturday we have paramotorist, paramotorist, I said that right, paramotorist versus cyclist. So this is another one with Hank. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit crazy, so I'm not sure, yeah. You, you have to watch to find out. Basically, Hank races a paramotorist, one of those. Yeah, you know when you have the fan on your back? Yeah. And you, one of those. I bet he wanted to do that bit rather than cycling, didn't he? I think he did. I think he might have tried it out afterwards. But anyway, on Sunday, Manon Rise Parry Ancaster, which is a cracking gravel event in Canada. Yeah, I'm I look forward, forward to too. watching that one because I've not seen it just yet. All right then, that is all for this week's GCN show. Uh, don't forget to join us for our coverage every day of the Giro d'Italia over on GCN Plus if you can. If you can't, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>